Welcome to the fifth year of Build. I'm your host, Pornima Vijay Shankar, and I've got some exciting episodes coming up for you. We'll continue to debunk a number of myths and misconceptions related to building products, companies, and your career in tech via some insightful interviews with innovators in tech who are both inside and outside Silicon Valley, as well as some solo shows with me. I'm also happy to announce some amazing patrons who are supporting the show. If you'd like to join them and show your support for Build, visit patreon.com forward slash build to learn about the amazing perks we have to offer in exchange for your patronage. Enjoy the upcoming episodes of Build. Ciao for now. In the last episode of Build, we talked about why you don't need to constantly grow and build a big company in order to innovate in tech. If you missed that episode, I've included a link to it below. In today's episode, we're going to continue our conversation around why staying small can be a smart business strategy, and we're going to share some best practices for how to do it. So stay tuned. Welcome to Build, the show that debunks a number of myths and misconceptions related to building products, companies, and your career in tech. I'm your host, Purnima Vijay Shankar. In today's episode, we're going to explain why staying small can be a smart business strategy and share some best practices for how to do it. And to help us out, I've invited Paul Jarvis. Paul is the author of the brand new book, Company of One, Why Staying Small is the Next Big Thing for Business. Thanks for joining us today, Paul. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Yeah. So for people in our audience who may be joining us for the first time, let's quickly do a recap around what we covered in the last episode about why big isn't always better and that it's not the only path to build an innovative company in tech. Yeah. So I think th the main thing was that a company of one is simply a business of any size that questions whether growth is the byproduct of success, because I don't think that it has to be. And so a company of one isn't just a one person business. It's not anti-growth or anti-revenue. It's just a business that kind of questions whether or not growth is right for the founders, for the employees, for the customers, and for the long-term success of the business. And it doesn't have to be a tech focused or startup type company, but definitely leaning on technology and automation and, and the way that the internet works now for business can make it a lot easier to be a company of one, which is why I think if you are a tech company, that it makes a lot of sense to kind of think about the, the ideas and the questions that are brought up in the book. Now, I know some people in our audience may be thinking, whoa, Paul, uh, I work for a big company and I like working for a big company. So does this only apply to people who are looking to build a company of one person? Or do you have some best practices that we're going to cover today that may apply to people who are operating that big company? Yeah, I think that you can definitely apply the, and I think a lot of the book is like a, a mindset thing and it is a business book, but it's a lot of a mindset thing as well. So I think that you can apply a lot of the mentality and mental models from the book to a big company. And I think that corporations and bigger companies that kind of excel at creating autonomy for their employees to empower them are companies that can like actually be innovative if they're big. We talked about this in the last episode. Mm -hmm. It's easier to be innovative if you are a big company, if you empower your teams and not micromanage them or give them ways that they can work quickly and more ingeniously with fewer resources. So there's a few good examples that I can bring up too. So Google gives us engineers 20% time that they can focus on whatever they want. That's actually resulted in a ton of cool products and profitable products for Google. And I think that companies of one within larger organizations have a history of helping those organizations have those breakthroughs. And uh, a guy named Dave Myers, who used to work for LW Gorn Associates and makes Gore-Tex, was given dabble time to come up with new ideas within the company and came up with the coding that they were already manufacturing on guitar strings. Oh, cool. Turn it into, yeah, it's kind of neat because I use the, they make elixir guitar strings and I was a musician for a lot of years and I use those guitar strings 
And then they ended up using that to make like the coat that I also wear because I live in a rainforest. So I have a Gore-Tex coat. I'm just like, this is awesome. But like by giving companies a bit of like leeway or space or autonomy to have ideas and to bring ideas forward and to move with those ideas are, is definitely the, the best way that a bigger company can help its employees and small teams operate more like companies of one and have those like breakthroughs or ingenious ideas. And even like it helps their bottom line as well. So it's kind of yeah. a good idea to do that. So I know in your book, you cover a lot of best practices and we're going to share some of them in today's episode. But before we dive into them, maybe you can talk about how you went around testing these practices out so that our audience can see these are proven and replicable. Yeah, so the first thing is that I'm the company of one guinea pig for (laughs) what I've written about. Mm -hmm. I've been in business for 20 years, it's been profitable for 20 years, and in in doing that, I'm also a writer, so I started to write about it, and I started to hear from other people who kind of had the same mindset as me, and they started to share their stories, and I started to collect this, like, vast resource of stories from other businesses. I'm still getting them. It's funny, like, the book comes out soon and i'm still getting people saying like everything that i've read on like the sales page for the book is how i run my business a woman that makes inserts um she emailed me yesterday inserts for high heels Mm -hmm. that push your push a woman's heel in a slightly different direction Mm -hmm. make her back hurt less because high heels seem like they probably are very uncomfortable yeah and she's like, I, my business is, it's a multi-million dollar business that I run by myself. Wow, that's awesome. You're a company of one. It's like, yeah. I, I didn't know this business until then. So there's definitely like, I've just been inundated with stories from people. And the other thing is that in writing the book, the book has to, it's a business book. So it has to have a lot of research. So I've done years of research at looking at where like studies and actual facts deviate from standard business advice around growth. And I can share two studies that I think are probably best illustrate that where traditional business advice of like always be growing or like <laughs> money, like all of those might sound good in like a keynote from Elon Musk or something like, I don't even, I, he probably doesn't even give um, keynote speeches, but <clears throat> I just think that there's this plethora of data out there that, mm-hmm actually shows that growth isn't always good. So the first one I'll give to you. The first one is the Startup Genome Project, Mm -hmm. which analyzed 3,200 high growth tech startups, found that 74% of them failed, not because of competition, not because of bad business plans, but because they scaled too quickly. Mm. Second study, the study's like, the study is making the point for my book for me. I was so happy. The next thing is the Kauffman Foundation, along with, you know, the Inc. Inc. Magazine has mm-hmm. that 5,000 list. Yeah. So they did a follow-up study on the 5,000 fastest growing companies five to eight years later. And they found that more than two thirds of them were out of business, had undergone layoffs or had sold well below market value. Oh. Basically confirming the, the startup genome project. Yeah. And these companies weren't able to be self-sustaining because they grew and they spent based on what they thought their revenue would hit. Mm-hmm or based on the venture capital injections, right. and not based on their actual profit, not based yeah, on yeah. their actual revenue. A good example of that is pets.com. I don't know if you remember okay. pets.com. No, they, I don't. Yeah, tell me. They, were, they just sold like um, dog and cat food. Okay. And they had a bunch of investors. They ran a Super Bowl ad. It was one of the first tech startups to run a Super Bowl ad. This is many, many years ago. I don't even know how many years ago because I don't even watch football. But... There was, they ran, a, they spent millions of dollars on advertising and they, they sold their products at cheaper than retail and even mm-hmm. cheaper than they were paying for the products mm-hmm. in business. Like the, the warning bells, yeah. are, like they're selling for less money than they're paying for the products. Margins. Yeah. Yeah. Margins kind of important. Yeah. They went out of business. Like they could, their burn rate was so high that they were relying only on capital, on venture capital to keep the doors open. Mm -hmm. And eventually that money ran out because there there was no way that they were going to turn a profit with that. So I think that looking at that, looking at all of that stuff and looking at all of the studies and the stories, I was just like, there's a lot here. (laughs) That's, that's really why I wrote the book because there was just so much information, so much data 
available on why growth should be questioned. It's not always bad, right. but it's good either. Awesome. Yeah, it's good that you've done all this research and that you've got some proven practices. So let's dive into the first best practice, which you said is resilience. Yes. So Dean Becker, who's the CEO of Adaptive Learning Systems, has been looking at and developing programs around resilience since the 90s. And his company found that resilience above anything else, above education or training or experience, is what determines success in business and success for companies. And the contrary to popular belief, like resilience isn't just something you're innately born with, like some people are more resistant, more resilient than others, it's not true. It can be learned and I think resilient companies and resilient people have three common traits and this is what uh, Dean found. So the first one is acceptance of reality. <laughs> it's a big one. Yeah. <laughs> It's hard to do and it's scary to do. So we can't control everything. We, everybody wish we could. If we could be in control of more things, things would be better. We can't. So resilient businesses know that because we can't control the markets or our customers, things are going to change and we have to roll with those things and accept what reality is and then deal with what reality is instead of dealing with what like we think is a best case scenario. Because Life and business doesn't typically just dole us out best case scenarios. I wish it did. Yeah. It's like a game on a monopoly, literally. Yeah. <clears throat> so I just want hotels on all my properties, right? <laughs> they want. The second part of resilience that a business or a person needs is a sense of purpose or like a sense of greater good. Because a lot of times, like we talked about a lot here, is that things don't always go right. And a lot mm -hmm. of times things can go wrong. And so if we don't have a sense of purpose, things could not be worth it. Like, I think that I'm okay in my business to be stressed out sometimes because I, I know that I have a purpose. I know that what I'm doing is mostly awesome and mostly great. And it's afforded me the life that I have. So it's okay if some days are bad. It's okay if sometimes like I could have a higher churn rate next month for one of my products. And I want to do something about it, but I know that what I'm doing is the right thing to do. So I can get through the bad times if I have a greater purpose for why I'm doing those things in the first place. Third thing is the ability to adapt. And we kind of hinted at this in the first part where mm -hmm. it's harder to change if you have a lot of moving parts. Right. So if you're a smaller business or you work in smaller autonomous teams, it's easier to adapt because when things change, we have to as well. So if the market changes, if like, um, like a good example of that is like Netflix and Blockbuster, right? Like mm -hmm. Netflix shifted away from DVDs to online streaming and Blockbuster is just like DVDs. And like how many Blockbusters are there? Zero, I think at this point, I think there might've been, I think I read somewhere this summer that there was still one block, some like independent blockbuster store open somewhere in middle America. Wow. I don't know if that was true or not, yeah. but still, like it's, if you can't adapt, like things change so quickly in tech mm -hmm. and in the market, like if you can't adapt to those changes, you can't be resilient and it's harder to succeed if you're not. So I think that, yeah, the first best practice is to look at how you can make your business or even just yourself personally, more resilient and that doesn't mean like stronger and infallible as we covered in the first part right. it just means like rolling with the punches and assuming that even if things are failing now if you have a higher purpose or just like a greater purpose in life and in your business that you can adapt and change and kind of like it 20 years ago i wouldn't have assumed that i would be where i'm at now but things kind of changed all the time like i went through so many different niches when i was doing design but so many different products as a, as a product person now that like, it's cool. Like I'm, I'm happy with where things are at, even though there's no way I could have guessed that. Yeah. I've kind of been like adapting every single day almost. Totally. Yeah. Well, we, we, you know, hindsight is 2020 20, and we're not fortune tellers. We are people in, in business in tech. So that makes a lot of sense. Now let's dive into best practice number two, which you said is autonomy and control. So I kind of hinted at this one a little bit as well, mm -hmm. where companies of one are becoming, or it's like smaller teams in general, I call them companies of one, 
companies that are companies and teams that have more autonomy and control in the work that they do because they can make decisions based on what's best for the team instead of like having stakeholder meeting after stakeholder meeting. Yeah. So, and this is why, this is also, I think, why so many people are moving from, and, and there's like a, a shift that's like factually and statistically true where people are moving from mostly working in big companies to like, it's almost 50, 50 working for yourself mm. versus working in companies now in America. Oh, and I didn't know that. 25% like five or six years ago huh. and when we started it was probably less than 5%. Mm -hmm. so there's a shift because people want a ton. They want to be in control of things. Yeah. And I mean, control, <laughs> philosophically control is an illusion, but there are <laughs> a couple things that you can control. And I think that having autonomy, having the ability, like it just feels like you can get more invested in your work. Right. You feel like you have ownership of that work which is yeah. why a lot of us are working for ourselves, to be honest. Yeah. I think that having this, you, in, or, in order to have autonomy, you need to be good at the thing you're doing. It'd be really hard to be autonomous and not know what you're doing. So I think it's good to, to have that autonomy. You need to master a core skill set first. So you need to think about what you can get really good at where you don't need direction and management as much. Mm -hmm. And, and move forward from there. And I think a lot of times we think, especially big companies could be scared of autonomy because they think autonomy means that I don't get any say in anything that team or that person is doing. And that's not actually true. I think the opposite of control is anarchy, not autonomy. Mm -hmm. So I think autonomy is kind of in the middle of that. And I think it's the best part between like absolute control and anarchy. Right. Autonomy is there is some steering of the ship. Like you do have to listen to stakeholders. You do have to listen to like what your customers are saying or telling you, but you can take all that information and make informed decision, not have a decision given to you, which is why I think having autonomy and being able to control those little bits of things that we can control is such a best practice for being a company of one or even just adopting that mindset in a bigger company. So let's dive into the last or the third best practice, simplicity. So I think we kind of touched on this in the first one too, but I think where simplicity becomes a best practice is that it's easier to do things when they're at any size in business where there's mm -hmm. rules, simple processes, simple solutions, because complexity can seem well-intentioned. Like let's just add more to our process, to every process. And then especially at large, comp at large corporations, things can get so complicated that it's hard to do just little things, right? Like if accomplishing a task requires more in the process than it does to accomplish the task, that could be a problem. Yeah. Like it's a slippery slope to just keep adding more to every solution because then you're going to end up with like having to do one small thing that requires sign up by six department heads and like legal review and then like meetings with stakeholders. It's just like, I just wanted to change this button to a different shade of blue that's more on brand. It's like, it, it's a slippery slope. So I think by contrast, uh, a company of one can mean simplifying rules, processes. And I think it, it then frees up time if you have very simple rules that say you can just remember, the, like if there's a handbook that's this thick of like rules and processes for how you do your job, you can't memorize that. No. Yeah. Like, a, like a list of three or four things, like this is how this needs to be accomplished. I can just remember that, or I can just like refer to a Google doc on that and take 10 seconds to read it instead of two days. Then it becomes a lot better. And I think that um, with this goal in mind of simplicity, companies of one can kind of question everything. And just like we talked about enough in terms of business growth, I think we can think about enough in terms of like rules and processes and solutions. Yeah. Where is this process efficient enough? Are, this, are, steps, are there steps in this process that can be removed? And is the end result kind of the same or even better? And is this rule or process helping or hindering our business? Because sometimes less is more in that case. So I think being simple is just easier to run a business that's simple 
because running a business is hard anyways. So if you can make a couple things easy, why not do that? It's just, it's just be less stressful, I think. Well, I also say like that cognitive load that you experience, whether it's having to constantly ask for approval or figure out how to do it, can end up sucking all your creativity anyways, which was like the whole point of getting into business and wanting to be innovative, right? So I totally hear you on the simplicity side. Yeah. So now I know in the last episode, we shared a number of myths around growth, as well as building a big company. And I think it's only fair if we share some of the gotcha moments that you've had when it came to running your company of one. So do you mind sharing maybe a couple of those moments with our audience? Yeah. So I think the, the first thing is that every opportunity has a cost. And because I work for myself and I'm only one person. I have to say no to a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And even like speaking and traveling, like I cannot do either and keep my business running. But that said, I don't actually like doing either of those things. So it's kind of fine. So that's an okay trade off for me. Mm -hmm. But I've also had to kill off a couple profitable businesses because they were taking too much time. And I don't like having my focus on, I actually like having a bunch of different products. Mm -hmm. So if any one product is taking up all of my time, then I, that's not a success to me because I get to define what success is because I, it's my business. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> so I've had to kill off. Like I had a WordPress theme business that mm -hmm. was doing really well, but it required so much support that I couldn't focus on anything. Like I didn't even have time to write articles. And I was like, this isn't worth it. Like this to me, the costs don't outweigh the gains in this case. Mm -hmm. So I could have hired, like granted, I 100% could have hired a support team to take care of that. Mm -hmm. And if I was a different person, that would have made total sense. Right. Because I don't want to manage people. I don't want to have a business that has that many moving parts. It didn't make sense to me. So I killed that business off, even though it was like, it was the, the second most profitable thing I was doing at the time. I was like, this this just doesn't make sense. I mean, if I was a bigger company or if I wanted to grow, I could have dealt with that problem a lot easier, but because I know what I want in my life and in my work, it didn't make sense. So I had to, I had to get rid of it. I've certainly gone through that as well, where I've had like courses that I decided, you know what, I just, I think there's too many people in the market kind of teaching similar things. So I'm just going to double down and teach this like one thing and hopefully, uh, you know, have enough to get by and build the business that I want to build. But more isn't always better. And sometimes killing things off can be really stress relieving. So I always look to say no and to kill things off. Those are kind of my two new mantras as a new mom who has to you know, juggle that cognitive load and also doesn't have as much time as it used to. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's, I think that's smart. Yeah. So anything else you'd like to share with our audience today? Yeah, I think even just touching on the point that, that you just made, I think mm -hmm. that we, especially in tech, like we wear busyness as this badge of honor. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I don't know why, like, it seems like I work 16 hours a day. Oh, well, I work 17 hours. Like, you're killing yourself like it's not it's really hard to sustain that and I mean totally. I, but I've been there like I I totally understand it because like in my 20s my early 20s was especially yeah I would work that many hours and like I didn't have a family like I didn't have a life either so it was easier to do that but like yeah. the more now like if I work six hours a day and I've moved the needle on some stuff I'm like good done yeah I, I can walk away and feel good about what I've done. And I think that busyness just leads to burnout. Busyness leads oh. to, I also think that it's not strategically smart to be busy all the time, because I think when we're so busy working in our business, it's hard yeah. to take a step back and work on our business and to think about the things that we talked about, to think about like, does this growth make sense for me? Does this make sense for my customers? It, what's the cost of this opportunity so the more that we can like just take a little break and, and to think about like the business that we want to have and the, the daily life that we want to lead based on the implications from making business decisions I think it's I think it's good and a lot of times like for me and it's different for everybody like it's hard for me to be on all the time and to be like creative problem solving or even like coding and designing all or writing yeah. all the time and like, it's hard to just sit and work and have great ideas. Whereas if I'm like 
out for a surf or hiking in the woods or taking a break and going to the gym with my wife or something, then like taking a step back from work is typically like, I have great ideas when that happens. And then like, I'll just make a quick note and then get back to what I'm doing. And then I don't have to think about it till the next time I start working again. So I think that this like counterintuitive productivity thing is like, just don't be productive for a while. And you're probably going to have some great ideas that's going to lead to increased productivity when you actually get back to work. Totally. Yeah. My 20 year old self that. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Uh, Yeah. That's it's, I was the same, same way in my twenties and definitely not that way anymore. And uh, um, you know, my magic number is also six because I only have eight hours of childcare. So I do like six hours of work and then I have two hours of workout time, which is like, you know, going to the gym or coming back or going to swim and come back and then shower and eat lunch and all that stuff. So uh, I'm glad it's also yours and I'm not the only crazy person trying to like cram in just a little bit into that six hour day but keep it effective yeah I think that's the other thing too it's like if you're given eight hours if you give yourself eight hours or even if you give yourself 16 hours a day yep. you're probably not going to be productive for that amount of time you're no. going to end up on YouTube or Facebook or yep. Twitter, and you'll be watching otters fist pump <laughs> <laughs> which you may need to know if you are going surfing yeah exactly I've, I've <laughs> wanted to be surfing just like fist bump an otter I have had a dolphin swim like oh wow my surfboard i've yes. also seen videos of dolphins kicking surfers off of waves Ooh. Or, which is kind of funny but yeah, have to yeah find those. That it's hard to be like super super productive for the amount of time we give ourselves to work so i would rather just be productive for four to six hours yeah. and then stop working because totally. i'm getting the same amount done as somebody working for eight hours or 16 hours I'm just sitting at my desk last time. And as you get older, your back will thank you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm actually at a standing desk, which I love. And anytime I have to sit, I just cringe uh, for work. So I prefer doing the standing desk. Nice. Yeah. Well, tell us a little bit about your book, when it's coming out, how we can get our hands on it. Sure. So the book, Company of One, comes out January 15th. Mm -hmm. Um, it's being published by a traditional publisher, which means that it should be available anywhere that you get books on the internet or at bookstores. And really the whole point of the book is not to say that growth is bad. It's just to say that maybe we should think about growth because maybe growth doesn't make sense. And you don't have to be, like we talked about, you don't have to be one person to be a company of one. You can adopt that mindset at like a tiny startup or even at like a big tech company. So I think just the idea that we can figure out what enough is and we can change the goals and the processes that we have to facilitate for post enough where we're just trying to get better and optimize for what we've got as opposed to just always shooting for more revenue or more customers because that can lead to a a lack of resilience in, in business. So I think that's really, yeah, that's really company of one. I think yeah, check out the book. If that sounds interesting, I, the book website is of one.co, but the book should be everywhere and it's, it should be everywhere around the world as well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Paul, for coming on the show today. Thanks, Pranima. I appreciate it. That's it for today's episode of Build. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel to receive the next episode and share this episode with your teammates, your friends, and your boss. Ciao for now. Build is brought to you by amazing patrons. Our platinum patrons are Andrea Goulet, CEO and co-founder of Corgi Bites, Sharbel Saman, founder of Sprintwell, Dee Gill, founder of Chime On, Jamie Hand, and Lauren Hassan, CEO and founder of Developer, as well as the following patrons. If you'd like to join them and support Build, please visit patreon.com forward slash build. In exchange for your support, you'll receive perks like advanced copies of our books from authors highlighted on the show, special pricing on upcoming Femgineer courses, and more. Welcome to Femgineer's Confident Communicator course introductory video series. I'm Pornima Vijay Shankar, the founder of Femgineer. And I'm Karen Catlin, a former tech executive who's now an advocate for women who are working in the tech industry.
For the last 22 years, I have been speaking in public and for the last eight within the tech industry. I have given a TEDx talk, I've been a guest lecturer at Duke's Pratt School of Engineering, an entrepreneur in residence at 500 Startups, a mentor in residence at Techstars, and was the founding engineer of Mint.com. I am on my second career. In my first career, I spent 25 years building software products. I started out as a software engineer and over time moved to the executive level where I was a vice president at Adobe Systems. Now, in my second career, I'm an advocate for women, which means I do a lot of public speaking about diversity, about women's leadership topics, and I've given a TEDx talk. The Confident Communicator course is a live online course that Karen and I co-teach together. In this video series, we're going to give you a sense of what the Confident Communicator course is and what you'll get out of it. You'll learn about the challenges Pornima and I have faced learning the craft of public speaking ourselves. You'll learn why we decided we just couldn't keep all of this knowledge to ourselves. And you'll hear from students who have taken the class about how they have become more confident communicators. You're going to get a behind the scenes look at the entire course. You'll meet some past students and see how they went from being shy and nervous to poised and confident communicators. You're also going to meet employers and sponsors who found the course valuable enough to invest in and send their people. And finally, you'll get some sample lessons so you know the material that we're going to be covering. Sign up below to receive the first lesson immediately where you'll understand why it's not good enough to just be heads down. You need to speak up to get the recognition you deserve. Ciao for now.